Does manual treasury management and operations have your crypto business stuck in the slow lane? Scale up and speed ahead with Fireblocks, the number one platform for crypto operations and trading pros that makes custody, settlement, and rebalancing quick and easy. Visit fireblocks.com to learn more. This episode is brought to you by Coinbase Prime, an integrated solution that provides institutional investors with an advanced trading platform, secure custody, and prime services to manage all of their crypto assets in one place. Futuristic companies like Tesla and MicroStrategy have used Coinbase's comprehensive investing platform to execute some of the largest trades in the industry. Learn more by visiting coinbase.com prime to get started today. Eager to make more informed decisions around crypto using data you can trust, Chainalysis demystifies cryptocurrency by providing industry-leading compliance, market intelligence, and investigation support for all crypto assets for organizations like Gemini, Crypto.com, and BlockFi. Maximize your potential with the leading blockchain data platform by visiting Chainalysis.com now. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Scoop. I'm your host, Frank Chaparro, Director of News at The Block. And joining us on the other side of the mic is our good friend. Uh, his name is very phonetic. <laughs> Alok Vasudev, <laughs> co-founder at Standard Crypto. We've been trying to get you on the show for a while. We had your partner on last year, Adam. It's good to have you get your perspective on, on what you're seeing in the market. It's an interesting time to be a venture capitalist. You're getting more and more friends out there trying to deploy. It's a very frothy period of the market. What, what's it looking like from your seat? Well, uh, it's great to be here, man. Um, thanks for having me. I can say definitively, this is the highlight of my week so far. Yeah, it's a good way to start a Monday. Oh, yeah. And again, huge fans of all you do. Um, increasingly, um, your charts, your your articles, must reads, must shares. So, um, big big fans of of all of yours. I know the dashboard's amazing. It's like yeah, so good. Source of truth. Yeah, it's a you, amazing job um, with it. But but yeah, um, you know it's a it's a as always never a slow moment in crypto. I think that um, what's always fun about being a venture capitalist in crypto is that you just have such heightened competitive pressures from all sides. Um, and, and I think it just forces you to continually reevaluate what should you be doing, um, right? What's your value proposition? Um, what matters? And it's fun. It means that you can never rest easy. Yeah, it's an interesting point. Um, even as a journalist, it takes a lot of, there's a lot of con reconfiguring of what you're covering. When I think about when I started at the block, the types of firms I would write about mostly on the trading side, exchange side, and then that evolved covering more into more on DeFi, decentralized finance, and then the second wave of DeFi, which happened, you know, what are they called? DeFi 2.0, the last summer, and then now NFTs and, and even having folks on the show who are DJs or artists or illustrators. I imagine as a venture investor, you probably have to go through similar waves of reinvention to make sure you're not missing out on certain trends to invest in from your perspective and then obviously from my perspective to write about. Oh, constantly. Um, and, and right to some degree, um, that, that's part of the fun of being a crypto investor because we're really talking about um, a base layer technology right? And an enabler that can touch so many different end use cases. And so to some degree, part of what's really fun about being in the space is that, um, you know, you, you're just going to expand in your scope or you have the ability to expand in your scope with the technology. And right now we're talking about a bunch of really interesting consumer use cases that really weren't weren't ready for, for prime time a couple of years ago. Um, and so this evolution from kind of a, a monetary technology to then a financial services technology to then a broader consumer facing internet technology um, that that's the exciting part. Um, but but you're right. I think I think for us, um, th the good news is that we've always likened ourselves as entrepreneur followers rather than being overly thematic about where things are going and trying to develop um, um, too much um, kind of of a, of a fun specific thesis. And so um, to some degree, it's we get we we get the privilege to meet 
people who are trying to do the most wild things with crypto and stretch it into places it's never been before. Um, and then um, we, we kind of get to be seduced into visions of the future that, that then we try and, um, you know, try and enable. So if you were to kind of think about how the thesis, even though it's, it sounds like it's kind of like a, a more ambiguous thesis, but how has it evolved since maybe the firm was founded? So I would say that the, the thesis hasn't really evolved. It's that we want to be long-term partners to the entrepreneurs, to the communities, and, and to the projects that are going to be definitional um, and that are that looking back are going to have moved the arc of progress um, on crypto. Um, what's, what's evolved is just, is just what that means um, and, and the markets that they're in, um, the shape that they, that they take on. And so, um, right, I, I would say that you know, we, we we started the firm in, in late in in kind of the tail end of 2019, and so 2020 um, was was a big DeFi year, and and it wasn't such that we were like, hey, all we need to do is DeFi. Um, it was that that's where the best entrepreneurs were at that moment, and and it made all the sense in the world for us that uh, DeFi was a natural extension of the fact that crypto was primarily a monetary technology up until then, and so when you have money and then you have programmability, finance is kind of a natural outgrowth of that, um, and now to some degree we have these these monetary and financial primitives um, with a couple key unlocks, things like NFTs. Um, and now we've just kind of leveled up our toolkit um, to, to go after um, use cases that weren't ready a couple of years ago, but now are, um, right? I think, I think kind of broadly all things we're seeing in Web3 um, and consumer are deeply enabled by the last several years um, of, of infrastructure improvements, um, of conceptual breakthroughs that we've had. Um, and, and now it's, it's about thinking about verticals that are ready, um, right? And, and I don't know, for us, I feel like what we spend a ton of time thinking about is when is a use case um, prime for crypto? Because one of the ways to, to be unsuccessful is, is just getting ahead of your skis in terms of um, what crypto is capable of today. I feel like if you think about the space a few years ago, tokens were almost like a red flag. You think, why, why does this need a token or why does this have a token? And we joke about this internally, but I think it's true. Um, now, as either investor or um, market participant, you're, you're asking when token, not why, when <laughs> token, right? And so how, how did that, how do you think that shift happened? Do you think maybe, well, I'll just, I'll just raise the question and then we can go from there. How do you think that happened? I mean... I think that uh, we saw what happened to holding tokens, right? Uh, you, you did pretty well if you pretty much bought any of them um, over the past couple of years. Um, but we've always been huge believers in tokens. Um, I think there's um, one of the founders, uh, Brad Burnham, who founded um, Union Square Ventures and then Placeholder, he had a line that I'll steal, which is that um, we found the native unit for information networks and its tokens. Um, and so to some degree, um, I've always felt a deep resonance with the idea of a token um, as the means of value capture for a blockchain native protocol or service um, or product. And um, I think that, look, I think you've had overall shifts in sentiment about whether tokens made sense or not. Um, but, but I think that, you know, uh, well-designed tokens have always been explosive in their potential, um, not just in terms of delivering returns, but also in terms of fostering a really powerful community um, and an engine for um, a bunch of uh, an engine for product market fit and and something that's really attractive. Um, but I don't know. I, I think that what's exciting to us, they're, they're obviously kind of down the middle um, use cases for tokens um, that make all the sense in the world. Um, and, and those are tried and true. Um, and at some point, you're just like, yeah, that's the best business model you can have for this type of product or service. Um, but I think we're also kind of exploring the boundary right now about, hey, are there are there kind of token models that we're trying to create from from uh, kind of net new token models we're trying to create? Um, for example, I think you're increasingly seeing companies that have major parts of what they do centralized. Um, also contemplating what it means to have a token side by side with that. And I think kind of your default reaction when you hear something like that should be to be pretty skeptical. Um, but at the same time, um, I, th I think it's exciting to think about what it would look like to have a company and a, a protocol or a token that actually um, are a check and balance on one another. Um, and so I think, I think maybe there will be some sort of hybrid models that are intriguing um, kind of beyond what we've seen so far, which, you know, exchange tokens, um, examples or things like that, where kind of company, it, it, we have a token that's just subordinate to a company. Yeah, the exchange tokens have been interesting, um, especially the degree to which they haven't necessarily captured 
some of the upside that we see in the private market. Yeah. Something like FTT as an example. Well, it's hard, right? Just because um, it, there's, you have two means of value creation um, and value capture, right? You have a company and you have a token and it's really hard for the market to discern in many cases, um, you know, what's what. And so that, that therein lies the rub, right? I think when you have a DeFi protocol and um, it's, it's, a, it's a thin protocol where the entirety of it lives on chain, then you can have a contract that's controlled by tokens control the protocol and then you're done, right? There's, there's no competing system of record. There's no competing source of value capture that's ongoing. It's that if you own the, if, if you know, you own the tokens that control the protocol, then you control the protocol. Um, whereas with a business, you still have to reconcile all of the real world elements of it. So what business models do you think are, are, are primed for uh, tokens? I, I think in general, the more you do on chain, the more a token is likely to make sense. I think that's always kind of one of our heuristics. It's it's the, you know, if you, and if you're, again, if you're a DeFi protocol, um, you live entirely on chain. And so it makes all the sense in the world for a token to be the primary means of, of value capture or business model. Um, and then, right, and, and then we've seen other examples of, of tokens that have been really successful, like a DYDX, um, where it, it's, a, it's a company and there certainly are components to it that are dependent on DYX, the company, but so much of the heavy lifting of the protocol, right? The, the, of the back end, the logic, all of that takes place on chain. And so the fact that you have um, really important pieces of your product on chain um, give you a through line for tokens being appropriate. Um, but whereas if you're, you're entirely off chain, then it's really hard to, to kind of reconcile having a token as your, as your business model. I was talking to one project who they're going to end up having three tokens tied to their ecosystem, a rewards token. So this is the token you, you sort of receive when you are using the application. They're going to have a governance token. And then for people who are on the platform, they will have their own profiles. Then there'll be a social token as well that they're looking at doing. So that's the first time I've heard of like a three, a three prong approach to, to tokens. But there's also interesting questions around, right, the regulatory angle. I don't know if you saw that um, that piece that was penned by J.P. Morgan's Michael Sembolis, but it caused a bit of a bit of not controversy per se, but a bit of back and forth on Twitter. Right? When um, I tweeted out, he said that Uniswap, synthetics, and compounds are pseudo equities um, since they provide token holders with claims on future cash flow. And then Larry at the block, my colleague said, <laughs> would honestly love if Uniswap provided token holders with any benefit whatsoever, which I thought was pretty funny. But it does kind of present this, this dichotomy in thinking about whether tokens are pseudo equities or not in certain instances. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a tricky one, um, right? Because to some degree, tokens are they represent ownership or kind of control units, right, in, in whatever they govern. And so in Uniswap, owners of the token literally have, um, they have influence over the source code itself, uh, over not just what the token does, but the protocol. Um, and so to some degree, um, right, and, and we have a, it, it's a fully um, general purpose substrate that we have. So you can do whatever you want with it. Um, right? You could, you could vote to, to have cash flows from the protocol flow back to token holders. You could vote to just shut down the protocol or vote to do something to kind of, to, to fully cripple it. And so to some degree, um, big, that's what makes it tough to classify. Um, and so, yeah, you, you can kind of do anything you want with it. Um, and so right now it's not right. You can, you can very clearly make the case that like, yeah, there is no cash flow that flows back to most of these DeFi tokens. Um, with with a couple notable exceptions, um, like like MakerDAO, um, but but I think right the potential um, you can certainly make the case that it's there, and I would imagine that a lot of folks who hold these tokens or, or kind of think about them um, are are kind of underwriting that notion into into their model for value. Um, but but I think I think I know this is um, you know topic number number. 1,777, why we, uh, why we need more clarity on, on regulation. The other thing that makes introducing a token to your business model thorny is the governance angle. It, it, it's something that's not pointed out a lot, but governance or the issues of incentivizing participation in governance 
isn't a new problem, right? You see the same thing in equities. People don't really care about a lot of the decisions that they're entitled to participate in through being a shareholder in, in Ford, right? I don't really care who sits on the board or X, Y, Z. I just, just want the price of Ford stock to go up. But in crypto, some of these problems are so complex and mathematical that if you don't have proper governance or enough people weighing in, it can be pretty, pretty dire. But I know that's something that you guys focus a lot on and correct me on the details, but have engaged various colleges to connect students within different blockchain groups to participate in governance. Definitely want to talk about that because it's pretty interesting. But what do you think about th that problem of, of governance, the issue of people just not necessarily being incentivized to pay close enough attention to what's going on? Does it kind of poke a hole in this idea of uh, decentralization to an extent? Because if it's really just a few people making the decision, then it's a centralized decision-making process. Yeah. Uh, so there, there's, a, there's a ton to cover here. Um, but I would say that, that you're right. I think with any any system of governance, you're going to have a free rider problem. Um, you're going to have um, a turnout and engagement problem, and you're going to have um, some sort of selection pressures on on the folks that are most actively participating, um, or the issues that I think are are kind of most commonly populating the discourse. Um, so I think I think crypto systems with governance are no different. Um, what I would say. Um, is that it's still really early. And I think a big part of this is figuring out norms that make more sense. Um, for example, even in the past year-ish, um, and right, I would say we've really had on-chain governance. Um, I, I, I would say starting with, with kind of DeFi is really the first time that we've had it in a way that was um, uh, you know, a big enough scale experiment that we could start to, to, to kind of abstract learnings from. Um, but um, for example, already, right, we're, we're getting a sense for, hey, um, we need to balance the role of, of this diffuse token holder cloud and, and kind of what they and how they can have a say um, with what it means to actually get things done organizationally. Um, like, for example, should, um, you know, should every single thing go all the way through full blown protocol governance or should we have systems of accountability? Um, that, but, but where they afford folks perhaps a little bit more autonomy, um, for example. So one of um, one thing that we talk about is whether DAOs and how they're structured are actually going to evolve to look a little bit more like companies than they have in the past, um, but with radically different accountability structures um, because um, of of token holder governance. And so, like one one kind of mental model that we're trying out is could token holders to some degree be like the board of directors. Um, where they're the ultimate source of accountability um, for what happens, but then the DAO itself can have these more autonomous subgroups um, that, for example, ask for budget maybe like on a, on a less frequent basis than kind of on a per specific um, line item basis. Um, or right, you can have an engineering team that says, hey, the core developers could actually be like up for contract renewal, so to speak. Um, and, and, you know, the token holders can, can decide if they, you know, if they delivered what they said they would. Um, and so this idea of, of kind of balancing the transaction costs of running every single micro decision through protocol governance um, with this, this kind of new form of accountability that we, that we need to kind of make sure that we don't lose. Um, so I, I would say that's something that we're watching right now. Um, and in fact, um, I think we're seeing this shift um, in, in many DAOs in terms of, hey, um, we need to kind of really think about um, how we can just get work done effectively and continue to make progress. And, and what's the real role of having these token holders as the ultimate form of accountability? I love your roof, by the way, or your oh. ceiling. What's going on there? Is this? I dig it too. Like a wood? Yeah, it's a wood paneling. paneling. Rich yeah, mahogany. Really nice. I, I need some more mahogany. <laughs> In my setup, that's 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 problematic. But I don't have enough. When you, uh, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> um, when you think about um, the difference, or rather the juxtaposition of DAOs and projects with with a token, um, I'm sure many listeners who are maybe coming from a less crypto native perspective might think, okay, when is a DAO a DAO? When is a token project a token project? And when do the twain meet? And and how do they meet? Um, 
That's a good question. So, uh, I mean, a, a DAO, and, and this is, so a DAO is a pretty, first, it, it's, a, it's a horizontal concept, um, which means that like in, in a DAO is, is a term that's kind of analogous to, to the term corporation. Um, in the sense that it just it just kind of describes a form of organization, um, but just like you say that you know we 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 don't no one invests in the corporation space, um, right? The LLC industry, um, right? It's kind of an enabler for something else. And so similarly, I think that DAOs are just kind of a new way to kind of coordinate people, capital, resources, um, using the blockchain as a system of record for ownership um, and 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 things like that. Um, but but that's to say that that you know it, it's it's a way of 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 forming resources um, in the pursuit of a of a goal, and then that goal in some cases is better enabled by a DAO being the form factor by which people have organized in pursuit of. Um, in some cases, um, it's probably hurt by a DAO being the form factor by which people um, coordinated to achieve it. And in some cases, we don't know, and 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 that's often where we are right now. Um, is figuring out like where where do we actually get these profound benefits from having this form of organization um, in in support of something? So, for example, protocols are like DeFi protocols. Obviously, right? I, I think you're greatly advantaged um, if you have a DAO that is ultimately the steward of that protocol. This also raises an interesting question about the role of venture capitalists in a DAO world. I remember in 2017. And there were like t-shirt t-shirts that said this, uh, you know, ICOs are going to kill the VCs. And now they're saying the same thing about DAOs. Do do DAOs benefit from from having um, venture interests on the cap table, even though it's not really a cap table, but involved in the DAO? How can they add value in a in a world where they can just go to directly to to stakeholders um, or users and and raise money through that mechanism versus convincing you and and your colleagues to write a check well um, it's it's a, it's a good question and I would say similarly to what happened with with ICOs and, and kind of every other time that that kind of the the depth of venture capital as we know it has been forecasted um, I think there's always an element of truth to that and I think for us it means that like it heightens what you need to offer um, in terms of value. But at the same time, I think what venture is really good at um, are you get highly engaged, long-term oriented, well-networked, um, well-resourced, smart people that are in your corner and are going to be working tirelessly to help succeed. Um, so in some sense, um, VCs holding tokens are, are no different than other members. Um, it's just that we work under a set of constraints that in many situations can be quite positive. Um, for for who we invest in, um, but I, I would say that that it, it means that in many cases, you know, it, it's it means that we have to ask for the opportunity, um, and it means we have to convince the DAO and the community that we're a worthy partner, rather than um, DAOs going off and and you know road showing what they're doing. Um, but I think that we're we're big believers in it. We've uh, we've partnered with with many DAOs, um, and 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 that just means um, we've joined the DAO like like any any contributor would. Um, our contribution um, takes takes of the the form of capital, but then uh, but then other things that we bring to the table as well. Um, but um, I, I think it's great, and and we love doing it. I would also say that you have to be cognizant of the coin table. Um, this is also something that I think is a little bit different. I think it, it applies to to protocols in general, but especially DAOs. Um, in the sense that if, if investors own too much of these things, then it actually ruins their uh, their potential. And so there's a balance between um, when you think about, hey, what, what's a coin table that sets up the DAO for success? Um, then um, there's certainly like a piece of the pie um, where investors um, could, could be really positive. Um, but if it's too big, then I think it certainly cheapens the appeal. Um, and, and you're kind of worried about it being too insidery dominated. Um, or, or you know, you're you're you should be like rightly so concerned as as kind of a retail holder um, about a VC selling and tanking the price, etc. Having trouble keeping pace with the crypto boom? When your business is scaling up and your portfolio is growing, you don't want to waste precious time on manual treasury management or settling in rebalancing. Fireblocks can handle that for you with smart, scalable solutions 
for your crypto business, along with industry leading security and expertise. They'll take care of the back end so you can focus on the big picture. Visit fireblocks.com to learn more. This episode is brought to you by Coinbase Prime, an integrated solution that provides institutional investors with an advanced trading platform, secure custody, and prime services to manage all their crypto assets in one place. Coinbase Prime fully integrates crypto trading and custody on a single platform and gives clients the best all-in pricing in their network using their proprietary smart order router and algorithmic execution. Futuristic companies like Tesla and MicroStrategy have already used Coinbase's comprehensive investing platform to execute some of the largest trades in the industry. Build a unified investment portfolio with one of the most trusted names in crypto. Learn more by visiting coinbase.com prime to get started today. Are you eager to make more informed decisions around crypto using data you can trust? Chainalysis is here to help. Chainalysis demystifies cryptocurrency by providing industry-leading compliance, market intelligence, and investigation support for all crypto assets for organizations like Gemini, Crypto.com, and BlockFi. Gain unparalleled visibility and maximize your potential with the leading blockchain data platform by visiting Chainalysis.com now. From the perspective of a um, investor, is there something? What are, what are the pros and cons of investing in a DAO versus a traditional uh, equity company? Are there some things that you, you you like more, like less? Does does the DAO make your job harder, easier? Well, I, I think we we look for situations where um, whatever is being done, the product or service or business model is is enhanced by the fact that it's a DAO or only uniquely possible by virtue of it being um, done by a DAO. Um, right, for example, um, one one category that, that we're really fascinated by um, and, that, and that we've made um, a few investments in, um, one one most, um, we, we announced it, um, or it was announced a couple weeks ago, um, is we partnered with the Squiggle DAO, which um, they are um, a, a DAO that was birthed by members of the um the art blocks project chromie squiggles their community and um they had this really unique kind of immaculate conception story where um uh people just decided hey what if we created a dao and contributed our squiggles in and in exchange got back this this kind of dao token and let's see what happens and then fast forward um they amassed this really meaningful treasury of, of squiggles um the assets and they they also uh, have this really terrific community around it. Um, and so um, that's an example, that business model, right? NFT collection, adding that that sort of really unique curatorial signal um, onto these assets. That's something that I think DAOs are pretty uniquely suited to. Um, and so in situations like that, it makes a lot of sense. In fact, part of our thesis for it, um, which, uh, which, um, which, which I think is really interesting to think about is that DAOs in fact actually add value as holders. Um, Right, and if you'll bear with me, um, kind of an analogy to art, which is something that we've been um, we've been trying to learn more about. But um, so in the art world, right, provenance um, is everything. Right, who owns a piece of art um, really, in many cases, dictates what type of value it takes on, and the path dependence of who holds it and sells it to whom. Um, that's integral in in its value. And um, if you have if you own art in with a financial motive that's very legible, it's really bad. For the value of the art, right? No artist wants to um, want a holder um, that that they know is just trying to flip it or trying to turn it into a profit. Um, and and to the point where even if if you're not a purely financial motivated financially motivated holder, but you come from finance, you still need to use like shields of obfuscation on top of yourself in order to actually hold art in a way where like you can actually get people to sell to you, or in a way where it's not going to destroy your value. Um, and so like for us, it, it was this question: is like, well, like. Is our VC funds um, owning NFTs? Is that the right side of history? Um, in in the sense that, like, yeah, you can make the argument that once projects have kind of reached critical mass, um, and then um, and, you know, and depending on the on the on the specific assets within the project that people hold, maybe it'll be fine. Um, but you got to wonder, like, is is a venture firm owning owning art? Is that is that the best um, for the art? Is that best for the community? Um, and so you think about, okay, who would add provenance, positive provenance value? 
to a to an NFT or a piece of art if they held it. It's clear individuals hold a lot of of kind of positive provenance value, um, right? Great individual collectors. I think that's that's never going to um, not be a thing. Um, and then you say, well, what if what if actually like people that that need to generate returns holding it? What if that's actually bad? Um, and then you're left with DAOs. Um, and 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 we think the DAOs are some of the most positive provenance value that you can have, because DAOs give uh, a, a piece of art or a collection of art leverage on community. Um, they have resources and a team that's working to actually increase the cultural relevancy of the project. Um, in Squiggle DAO's case, they're going to be building a bunch of really cool um, products and services um, to really continue to add value to the community of yeah, holders. Let's, let's double click on that for a second because there's a lot i i think if i played a recording of you if i played this recording to you when you were a i think you what did you you were doing hardcore phd research at stanford and played that back to you about the squiggles and the DAOs, you'd probably be like what am i like am i in the future uh, addicted to shrooms or something like <laughs> what is the deal what am i talking about I pinch myself. I can't believe this is real life. I love it so much. It's nuts. But but basically, right, Squiggles are it's 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 an NFT, right? And so they created a DAO that the the community of holders of the Squiggles. That's right. Right. Decided to create a DAO, and you're explaining what that DAO will yield these products. But maybe we can just take that and make it a broader question of why do NFT projects these collections which are typically started by an artist and maybe like a more biz dev savvy partner. What do they need a DAO for? Why does Squiggles need a DAO? Just might seem very weird for, for some listeners. Yeah. Um, it's a great question. I don't even know if I'd use the word need. Um, I, I would say that, um, that a DAO forming is very interesting. And I don't think that every project needs a DAO necessarily, but I think certain projects merit DAOs and they attract DAOs and the resources and attention um, that that kind of a DAO requires to become viable. And, and then once it's kind of crossed that threshold, then there's a, a lot of opportunity for the DAO to create value for the project. So um, it's, it's not a necessarily a need thing. It's more so that this is a, um, a really unique occurrence um, as a byproduct of a really unique project that's already struck a chord to this degree. Um, but, but to take a step back, I would say that um, NFTs, especially, um, and especially of the variety that we're most familiar with today, um, I think really what we're looking for um, is, is cultural relevancy, right? To some degree, it's, it's uh, projects that strike a chord um, with, with, with people and, and a community. Um, I, I think that's the power in these things. And I think in, in many cases, it has to do with the origin story, um, right? Punks um, being the oldest, is, is a, is a, that's an important part of, it, of, its, of its lore. Um, in other cases, it, it has to do with, with maybe there's a specific mechanism or even the, or, or even the art just resonates. Um, but I think um, NFTs to some degree um, are, are more bookmarks for a community rather than they are... Um, write something in their in their kind of own right that that would be valuable without it. It's a strange concept to unpack because it's not like anything in the analog world per se. But I guess you can think of it as instead of art maybe think of them as as watches, right? And there is a company behind Rolex, right? And and they're making these decisions that, you know, produce future watches. Um, there's not really a community there, but if we're trying to think about what the future of these NFT collections are, I think many people looking in just see, okay, artists mints are a hundred or a thousand, 10,000 JPEGs and millions of dollars are made and people make these JPEGs, their profile pictures, and they feel some inclination to this community. But then what happens next? What is, for instance, if you look at something like Board Apes, which is raising at a $5 billion valuation with A16Z involved, that's a, that's a lofty valuation. Like that is, that is a, I mean, the New York Times is $7 billion, right? So what, just as a comparison, I looked up the New York Times the other day for some strange reason, but what guarantees or what justifies rather a valuation like that for what to many people is just a bunch of images. 
Yeah, I, I would say that um, it's, it's a good question. Um, but I, I think that really um, folks that are excited about these projects and, and kind of thinking about valuing it in, in, in these levels, um, I think they view this stuff as, as really important um, and culturally relevant, um, almost IP for tomorrow to some extent. Um, right. I think I think to some degree, um, a lot of us, um, ourselves included, um, we're believers in these cultural outgrowths of crypto and Web3 are actually going to become mainstream um, and, and become some of the most sought after and recognizable imagery and characters and IP that's out there. Um, and, and I think and, and you can almost take that have that take in contrast to this idea that the old world is now going to kind of NFT all of their stuff. Um, and so um, I think I, I remember the first time I was I was kind of stunned that they were actually making an Angry Birds movie. Um, right. In the sense that it started at this like this this kind of this this fun little game you play on your phone. And next thing you turn around and, and it's actually being made in um, feature films. Um, and so this idea that kind of Internet culture is just going to become mainstream culture, I, I think, is already proven out. Um, and now I think NFTs are the next chapter in that story. And I think a lot of these assets and lore and stories um, that's come out of, of, of this world, um, I think, really has 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 incredible potential um, to just become some of the most iconic imagery and IP that we have out there. Yeah. So maybe that five billion dollar valuation is just a potential Bored Apes movie. Is it kind of like Star Wars? Like there's obviously value in a franchise of, of something. Yeah, it could be. I, I think I think it's to some degree. It's it's there's a community that's attached to these projects. There's kind of an owner base. There's a capital base, um, and I think that that's always front and center. Um, but then I, I think there are probably all sorts of really creative um, ideas for monetization down the road um, that can be there. But you know, it's we, we've certainly had we have IPs worth IP worth well into the billions. Um, so it, it's certainly not not entirely. Um, not entirely unreasonable. There could be a theme park. There could be an uh, yeah, why not? Bored Apes Disney World. <laughs> why not? Why not? Um, the you can it, it's called like the Bored Ape like floor price, and it'll just go like up and down, and uh, it's terrifying. Um, but uh, but yeah, and, but but also valuation. You, you know, these things are more about supply and demand for um, what the founder is willing to part with yeah. um, than they are about like you know bottoms up valuation um, analysis. So do you have to throw that out the window? Do you have to throw traditional means of evaluating, valuing companies out the window when you're kind of it, – because it seems from the outside looking in that people it, – it's almost like you know the housing market right now. Just to get in, you have to way overbid because there's just so many people trying to get the same house. And in crypto VC land, it seems to be a similar situation where now the old guards getting in and new seed funds are springing up every week. And even companies, right, are now trying to get in the game themselves. So does that just mean you have to kind of just pay even if the valuation models say this makes no sense? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, there's right like the, the supply and demand in the market is, is going to um, basically shift median valuations across the board. Um, I, I think it means that as a VC, you just have to um, really be um, deliberate in your beliefs. And, and I think that you have to have a point of view on, on valuation as it relates to your own portfolio and, and the math that you need in order to, to kind of make everything consistent with what you're promising your LPs. Um, but I think at the same time, I think venture has always been a game about um, imagining what could go right. Yeah. And, and, and I think that, that in, in many ways, pearl clutching about valuation has actually been foolish. Um, and, and in fact, right, like as an analogy, think about how much pearl clutching there was about layer one valuations in 2018 and 17. Um, but, um, you know, those that, that, that launched many of those, um, actually are, um, those were really successful investments for, for firms in that era. Um, so, I mean, these things always ebb and flow. Um, but, but I think that, you know, it's just a deeply individual story to the firm or to the, to the individual investor, right. About like, where do you have outsized belief such that you're willing to underwrite something, um, that that's kind of higher than, than maybe comfortable or your default preference. I think that's a good point. Although I would like to see them come down or at least slow down because it's just really overwhelming as a reporter. 
there's this one company that's raising at 10 billion that just raised at three or somewhere around three uh, a few months ago. It's like, come on, let's just let's wait for me to hire some more people before you keep <laughs> adding to adding to my to do list. It's wild, and, there, and there's a type of company, right? The there's the the, the picks and shovels company, um, where um, that that is like the they're just a siren song for for kind of generalist VCs, right? Because they don't have to go full full blown native on it, um, but they get to treat crypto like a fast growing vertical. And so um, those are those are candy and uh, to, to folks that that, that want to put money into the space. So do you think that's the most overrated segment right now? Where are you concentrating your bets? And probably not picks and shovels, it sounds like anymore, at least. Well, it's, it's all it's all going to work, um, right? Picks and shovels like these are you're going to have amazing companies um, that do that. Um, it's just a question of picking your spots in terms of. Um, um, right, like everyone's got a finite amount of money to deploy, and and you just need to um, figure out where you think you're going to generate the, the the best returns for your LPs, and 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 where do you think you're going to be able to do, um, you know, the most gratifying work um, as a firm. So um, that's not to say that 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 we don't like those businesses; we think they're great. Um, but but you know, it's a when you have um, when you're limited to kind of one section of the menu, um, then then you know. That that's what leads to a lot of the dynamics that we see there. Whereas we get the whole menu, um, which which means that that we just get to um, to look at more. Um, I don't know. I, I've always been um, one of like the the chief haters of all things um, permission blockchain, enterprise blockchain, this and that. Um, it's kind of an example of this overreach of where we are with the tech. Um, I, I think that just um, right like things that that we do on chain um, and just kind of constraining yourself almost to things that just kind of take place exclusively or mostly on chain um that to me still feels like where we are so i i don't think we're ready to, to tokenize houses yet or ready to to have companies put their supply chains on blockchains um but hey those are some people are interested and so maybe we're gonna just look like complete idiots it's just kind of boring right from the perspective of if you're gonna what you're gonna do day in and day out what you're gonna look at just tokenizing things is not is not the most sexy arena of what's happening in this space even though it would be fairly it would be a seismic shift in the landscape of the world but not as interesting as you know web3 perhaps yeah well well it'll it'll get there eventually um and 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 this is something where like um i i think that we have to keep making crypto native progress um, right. And we almost have to keep leaning into the weirdness um, that we get in crypto. And I, I think in many ways, right, it's, it's people who dismiss the space. I think they look at what we do. They look at the memes. They look at the jokes. They look at kind of the bizarre stuff that we're trying and, and they kind of view that stuff as like unproductive or a distraction. Um, but I actually think that um, it's the exact opposite. And we need to keep pressing on these threads and, and keep doing ridiculous things like trying to buy the constitution and, um, you know, all the other like zany experiments that our amazing community comes up with. Um, because like only if we kind of keep pushing the boundary on the native side, um, will we actually make these deep conceptual breakthroughs that are again, um, right. You can almost like take it to the bank that like when we actually have businesses using blockchains, um, there'll be some like frog pick degenerate that actually kind of like helped harden a mechanism or something like that, that ultimately gets adopted by, by Cisco or something like that. That's a really good way of looking at it. It's also fun. Most people, once they get over the weirdness, uh, I think end up having a lot of fun in the, in the space. Oh yeah. Like you tell me that like, look, we, we started with um, a, a DAO made a credible bid to buy the constitution. Um, I think there's another one links out. They're going to buy a golf course. Um, right. It's, it's, a DAO is going to buy a company soon, and then a DAO is probably going to buy a public company. Now that would be weird, and it'll be wild. That that will be an interesting day. We'll have you back on when that happens. Yeah, but blur your eyes and zoom out, right? But like, what's going to like just like follow the trend line, um, right? If you believe that like capital is going to stop forming um, in crypto, or that the the scale of capital formation in crypto is going to slow down, like I don't think so. Um, and so just like keep extrapolating forward, and it's going to get really weird. A DAO is going to buy a country. Yeah, why not? Uh, that might be that might be tough. Yeah. <laughs> well, hey, this flew by. I know that um, you've got got a hard stop. I can't wait for this episode to come out. This was this was really interesting. We hit everything: DAOs, NFTs, governance, the VC landscape, memes to an extent. 
where can our listeners uh, learn more about what you guys are doing? So uh, Twitter for me personally, um, Alok Basudev on Twitter. Um, I think we have been our firm thus far. We have very much been an IKYKY kind of a firm in terms of our um, public positioning. But um, part of our goal this year is to be a lot more open about what we do and how we think. Um, and so there will soon be um, more surface area that people um, on the internet will be able to, to find about standard crypto. Awesome. Well, Alok, thanks so much for being on the show. This was a lot of fun. Uh, talk to you soon. Once we uh, once one of the movies come out, maybe we can do like a a like viewing uh, episode of the of the scoop and we can just like watch the show and pontificate about it. Watch the movie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it'll have to be like a Mystery Science Theater 3000 <laughs> thing where we just we just rip on it from the from the front row. That'll be fun. Well, thanks so much for coming on. <laughs> thanks, man. Thanks for having me. The scoop will be back with you again with another great guest. Have an awesome day, everyone.